Welcome to the final session of Clifton. Um, I hope you've all had a fantastic festival so far. Uh, and I'm very excited uh, to introduce this panel. Uh, the panel is called Chaos Theory, Politics Now, the State of Modern Politics and the Collapse of Civility. So we're going to try and make our panel as civil as possible and hopefully uh, the opposite of what's going on in Westminster right now. So uh, next to me, I have uh, David Aronovich. Uh, David, how are you doing? Um, have I to answer that civilly? Yes, <laughs> as civil as possible. Uh, never mind how I'm doing, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you, darling. <laughs> next to David, we have Anne McElvoy. Anne, how are you Hello. doing? Hello, I'm doing extremely well. I had to present the last session, so now I'm a panellist, so I can behave really badly. You really can. Wrong in a it, civil so. way, of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, and then we have Harry Mount. Hi, Harry. Hi, June. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I think you're probably the one that's going to get it the most on this panel. Oh, because of writing a book about <laughs> Boris. Yeah. Exactly. No, completely writing a complimentary yeah. book yeah. about yeah. Boris. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not entirely. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, in case you were wondering where Sarah Vine is, uh, uh, she has been replaced by the chair of Clifton, Andrew Roberts. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Yay! <laughs> Can I point out that two days ago Anne was in America, yesterday she was in the Ukraine, and now she's here. So thank you for coming. Thanks, Anne. <laughs> this is a fun bit. <laughs> I'm off the leash. So I'm going to open up with a question that's for all of you, um, and I'll start with you first, David, um, which is how would you describe the current state of our politics, and in your opinion, how did we get to this place of... National division. <laughs> and do it quickly. Quickly. <laughs> and obviously as civil as and possible. Civilly. Um, the answer to how we got here is a long, long answer. I might kind of escape it. I mean, we had a major crash in 2008. Before the crash of 2008, broadly, people in democratic countries uh, and politicians, leading politicians, had a similar set of uh, beliefs and priorities. <laughs> Uh, in the aftermath of that crash, I think people lost significant amount of confidence uh, in those beliefs and priorities. That's thrown up a, uh, an increasing polarisation uh, and reaction to change. Um, and that linked together with, almost exactly in the same period, the incredible growth in a new form of communications technology in the form of social media, uh, has now begun to dictate to a significant extent the way in which we interact politically. Uh, and we have not yet found a way of making that work in a way that emphasizes <clears throat> moderation and civility yeah. rather than incivility and division. And we're all in our silence and following people that we agree with. Um, to an extent, yeah. So I would just build on that, don't agree, disagree with any of that, by saying, I think, to use an old phrase, the ties that bind, the ties that bind societies together are, are often much more fragile th than we think. And that because we rub along together, we watch a lot of the ta same television shows, or we, we did at least, uh, you know, we, you know, life is just much more fragmented, we tend to sort of assume that there is a kind of commonality uh, that is actually it's a big assumption, isn't it, if you think about societies. And I think about that when I go around the world, very different places where the strains are very apparent and often you know, really to the, to the point of, of conflict or even violent conflict. That I'm just like more amazed that societies have rubbed together as well as they have in the, the, the post-war period in Europe. I think in 1989, which was really when I started my journalistic career, we went into the post-war world as opposed to post-war world. Yeah. And, and uh, the promise of that, the expectation that it would simply continue to be very calm, to be reasonably considered, was, you know, that was always more questionable. The financial crash, as David has just referenced, certainly, I think, expedited divisions. Yeah. But it, it, a number of little straws in the wind came through to me. A couple of things. I'll just mention one at this point. When someone who was staying with me, a very successful uh, uh, tradesman uh, from my native northeast, who was fascinated by the fact that we just talked about politics all the time. And he told me how much he didn't like politics, didn't like politicians. And he was, this is not like the he wasn't a poor man. He was very sort of just very distanced from the whole world that 
uh, you know, I moved in and was, was living in, and he told me that he was voting for Brexit, so were his children, who were also really, yeah, exactly. And there's a whole narrative about it's only the, you know, the children of, of the world to do who are angry. A lot of other the young people, you know, are just kind of going along with something very different, and a lot of people are slow to pick up on it. I was certainly slow in parts, but I do think we we forgot how different our society is. So now we're all in a state of shock to discover what was actually in plain sight before. And that is the real challenge for our politics now. Now that we've woken up to it, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with yeah. that? Harry? Um, well, I think the obvious first answer is we're split down the middle, or 52, 48. Um, and uh, that is obviously still the division that's going on today. And you don't think it's moved? Uh, well, who knows? You can you can look at different polls, um, and the so it shouldn't have been that surprising. I wrote a book about Brexit shortly after the referendum, and I said Europe, in different ways, had destroyed all Tory leaders, as it has just done yeah. David Cameron, all the way back to yeah. Margaret Thatcher. And then yeah. I bumped into Professor Vernon Bogdanor, the famous constitutional historian, and he said, "You're right, but in fact, it goes back." Even further, he said that in part, anyway, mm. this is debatable, that Europe had done for prime ministers going back to Macmillan. So that would justify David Cameron's mantra in his uh, book, which I've just reviewed, where he says throughout, repeatedly, five or six times, I don't regret having the referendum, but I regret the result. And I think he's right in that eventually it was going to come along the road at some stage, maybe another 10 years, maybe another 20 years. But, it was always but a now we've chance. had it, and thus the chaos. Okay. Andrew? I, I too, like David, go back uh, to the 2008 uh, crash. Um, but then I also, with regard to Europe, of course, and I'm sure David would agree with me, go back much further than that because um, the, the uh, anger over Europe um, can be seen from the Maastricht um, time of the yeah. early 90s, yeah. and even earlier than that for some people. And so I think the, the real um, reason for the present uh, aggression and incivility and, uh, and split nation and so on is that uh, we had this referendum three years ago, leave won it, and we still haven't left. And so there is this sense of, of, um, of resentment against, um, against politicians. Which is on both sides. It's, it's brewing. It's like an undercurrent that's brewing continuously Yes, you get it. You also sides. get it from the people who won the 48%. Yeah. Uh, as well. So, you know, had this been in some way, you know, the boil been lanced soon after the uh, result, and I'm not saying I know how that could have happened, but nonetheless, to have waited three years is clearly going to build up pressure in the pressure cooker. Indeed. Well, the last three years uh, has become a bit of a reality show in terms of Parliament, with more twists and turns than an episode of The Kardashians. Um, so what I want to know is how do we think things are going to play out? And I'll start with you on this one. Well, I uh, thank you very much. Um, I <laughs> got it sorted, don't worry. Um, Who's going to be Chris Jenner? <laughs> I, I, the one bit of Boris Johnson's strategy, sort of tactics that lead to a strategy of new thing, that I, I would question would be, I mean, he, he can say that the 31st of October, if he wants to leave on the 31st of October, it does look like the Ben Act has tied his hands. He can try various shenanigans around that. We've sort of, we really have got into the sort of, we'll send a letter, we'll send another letter saying we didn't believe the first one. Mm. So I, I'm not sure that that will work, but I think quite clearly that the tactical way through it is to say, I have been forced. You know, he's basically doing the, the sort of note to the kidnappers, isn't he, through the kidnappers. I have been forced to say this. And then appeal over the heads of that to the country. I don't think he can get anywhere in Parliament. And I do think as much as uh, many people uh, who will, will feel that Parliament has had a great resurgence in the past few weeks, there is still no way through this for Parliament. And one can't forget that, that there is a limit to how long Parliament can play its part in this way without frustrating the country. So uh, Boris Johnson's uh, approach has been to try to go over the heads of Parliament. That will, I think, not work. But I would guess, if you just you know, force me to say something that probably not turn out to be, be right, I would guess it would be something like an extension, which he says he's forced into, plus a general election, which the opposition won't be able to resist for so much longer. And what do you think would happen 
if we uh, have a general election before Christmas? Well, it depends on the, really on the terms that you go with a bit yeah. into that general election. Do you think it? he'll so win? I think you've squeezed um, you've squeezed one prediction out of me. You know, two two as Oscar Wilde <laughs> said might look like carelessness to me. Uh, but, but predictions don't I would, matter I anymore. Have thought it's still it's pretty hard to see a Jeremy. Corbyn government, mm -hmm. but I do think, you know, you, you're looking at lots of potential alliances that we haven't seen in the past. Mm. I don't know whether the Liberal Democrats can actually deliver electorally on the kind of excitement which for them is all yeah. about yeah. Um, uh, remain, get, remain yeah. and re revoke. There is obviously a, a dislocate between revoke and, and Labour policy. I think it is perfectly possible that Boris Johnson, if he gets through this and if he's able to manage his Brexit party, which is like keeping a very, very big dog on a yeah. very, very long uh, lead, that he could bring home a, a majority but you know I, I really think that and maybe other people on the panel feel more absolutely confident about their prediction on this one I think we'd be looking at a, a general election it would be one of the most exciting and unreckonable that we've seen in, in our time covering politics yeah I think you're right on that one <laughs> Harry um, well Boris in his interview in today's Sunday Telegraph he's obviously doubling down on mm. the whole mm. idea of surrender yeah. so despite that causing that row last week in Parliament, and he said in the Sunday Times he, reject, he uh, uh, regretted using the word uh, humbug, which he was actually ha happy to use mm. over surrender, but not over the yeah. Joe Cox yeah. death. But today in the Sunday Telegraph, he's now moved up a grade from project surrender pro to project abject capitulation, which was new <laughs> words today. So he's obviously doubling That's down right. on it's that. It's quite interesting the kind of language that he's using. Isn't well, it? I think this is all uh, put forward by his Lieutenant Dominic Cummings, Cummings who yeah. one of the things about Boris is, and I worked with him for five years at the Telegraph, is he's very, very keen to be liked by those around him. Dominic Cummings isn't so keen to be liked by those around him. So he can use him as his sort of a Dr. Evil, as it were. So Boris and is really doubling Dominic down. Dominic Cummings doesn't have to answer to the electorate, so he can exactly. become the fall guy, exactly, as it were. Exactly. So I, I agree with Anne. I think there will be an election. I think it's unlikely he'll get an overall majority, but actually he's taking the gamble that even without mm. a deal with the mm. Brexit party, yeah. he might scoop up their votes. And one yeah. of the things that must be keeping many things that keeping David Cameron awake at night was could he have won the 2015 election without the pledge of yeah. a referendum because obviously yeah. UKIP had won the 2014 European election. elections and I think he probably could have because yeah. the Tory voters who had voted UKIP 2014 would, would have come have over voted. and Boris yeah. would be taking that gamble. Got you. Yeah. I find it rather difficult to get terribly excited about words like humbug, which I'd only really heard before from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Um, the idea that that is something that, uh, that is uh, a, a, a Churchill vicious, used language a vicious like that? slur strikes me as being uh, impossible to believe. Um, it's, I think it's quite clear what Boris's path must be. It must be to make sure that there is not a danger from the right in a general election. And so to veer... Um, towards the Brexit for Party position makes perfect sense when it comes to Let's electoral politics. Because, well, to stop it from mm, yeah. uh, to stop it from 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 scuppering you yeah. in constituency uh, after constituency, and so it makes perfect sense, I think, also for him to a, uh, to position himself in the Conservative Party mm. in such a way that Nigel Farage has no way of um, of uh, of wrecking the numbers. Yeah. <clears throat> in 2015, uh, the leaders of the leader of the Labour Party was Ed Miliband. The leader of the Conservative Party was David Cameron. Uh, in 2019, the leaders of the two main parties are, in turn, I think, uh, an extremist and a charlatan, and they are both trying to get people's votes on the basis that they're better than the other one and that they're each the only choice other than the other one. And I think that's pretty risky, uh, because if you look at the polls, what you'll see is there's a significant number of people uh, in Britain who don't seem to be up for either proposition. Yeah. They don't want Boris Johnson, and they don't want Jeremy Corbyn, and they are tired of being told by people that they must have one or the other. Mm. And increasingly, third and fourth parties are showing in the polls, and I think there is a significant chance that at the next general mm. election, if they play it right, both Corbyn and Boris Johnson are going to get a really big shock. Mm. Um, now, of course, this also happens to be what I hope will happen. So <laughs> I have the <a> temper. <laughs> 
So I have to temper. I have to temper that with the kind of you know that one tends towards uh, analytically in the directions of one's Dreams own uh, hopes and, and so on. Hopes. But as somebody, for instance, who did not believe that it was a shoe in that uh, Brexit would be defeated in 2016, right. and had written several times in advance of it that I was extremely warning that. Yeah. Well, very, saying what I thought we were moving towards for various for various kinds of reasons. And the other point I think is important to make here is that Brexit doesn't, is, it, it represents something more than itself. Mm. It actually represents to people their sense of who they are and yeah. what kind of country this yeah. is. And one of the things I'd say to people who continuously go on about how Remainers, how Brexit people will riot if they don't get what they want, is there are rioters plenty on the other side too if you want to threaten it. Yeah. Uh, because actually people who didn't necessarily consider themselves big pro-Europeans before 2016, they themselves now feel desperately pushed about by people like Boris Johnson and the Daily Mail and all these other people, telling them that they're surrenderers and that they're not wanted and, and that they're citizens of nowhere yeah. in particular and not yeah. of the right kind of countries and that somehow or other they're not authentic English people or authentic Britons. English people mostly because this doesn't really apply uh, in Scotland. Mm. So I think analytically you have to say that the next, if there is an election, whenever it comes, is the, and, and I think this is what Anne means by exciting, mm. uh, in that we have absolutely no idea what will happen. And that makes what Johnson has done an incre uh, increasing gamble. And the problem with it is that for the gamble to work, you have to lean very, very heavily over to one to the, side of yes. British politics. Yeah. Now, traditionally, People say, and we all know that Corbyn is leaning very heavily on the other yeah, side so. of British politics. Traditionally, what you've had to do, or usually what you've had to do, this is what I talked about the middle. consensus before, yeah. is that by and large you try and draw people from the other side over to you. Yeah. If you're not prepared to do any of that, yeah. but, you're, but actually your language, and this brings yeah. up the civility point, mm. tends you increasingly towards the most hardened part of your own side, your own vote, then that really is where the danger in way in which people talk to each other, I think, really emerges. Completely. And actually, when you look at how some of the Remain parties fared in the last elections, it kind of reflects what you're saying, in that that could happen in the general. I think so. Really? I'm not sure. That, I mean, it's a very difficult thing to, to map elections onto each other. That's yeah. a, a, one thing I would, uh, would say there. If we're thinking about that breakthrough of a third party, in this uh, case, the, the Liberal mm. Democrats, the Greens in Germany are polling 27% at the moment as well. So there's something in the air that is not just... We do get a little bit into the Brexit bubble. I mean, a lot of this stuff is happening across mm. Europe as well. It's just not, not uniquely... In Britain, it is, it is articulated yes. through the Brexit. I, yeah. I think it's sort of what you were saying yeah. when you said it was about other things as well as Brexit. Just to the civility point, the reason I worry about, you know, I predict a riot, as I think the Kaiser chief so, so rightly said, yeah. for those of you who are <laughs> down with the kids. Um, <laughs> the old kids. The old kids. That, that's how <laughs> I, I am. Mean, you know, I still think the Kaiser chiefs are a thing. The right? kids. Young, young, young people in the front row. Okay, go on. Um, is predicting riots because you want to sort of weaponise it, to use a sort of Diane Abbotty word, mm. I think is really silly. And I think it doesn't work at either end. I don't think it it works even as David suggested it. You're gonna have a riot. We're gonna have a riot. You know, sort of bring it on. Um, if, if you think you're hard Not enough, really it's terrible. To say. Yeah, I know. But it is. It Kinda. is where the argument is landing right now, yeah. which is. I object to this terrible language that was used. And so I'm going to now go and say something really extreme yeah. or I'm going to be shouty in the yes. commons and be a little bit shouty and yeah. you know make sure that... Because yeah. I think that way, my anger will outweigh your, your anger because your anger yeah. is really rubbish, yes. but my <laughs> anger is justified. Yes. Yeah. And I could... My lot could have a right... Your lot could... I mean, you I'm going to meet you on your territory. I think basically. what is happening really is that you're seeing... This is entirely political some of it is confected even mm. if people feel it in the moment it's confected it is i will be civil when i have won mm. and that is i think you know the, the really difficult bridge to get over is in the end someone might be uh, you know andrew maybe right boris might bring home this stonking great victory david might be right there might be a resurgence of third party politics someone's going to go home disappointed after the general election and at that point we really are going to have to start to be civil and you know we'll have to be civil when we most feel we don't want to be and we'll have no choice Harry, what can we learn from history? And the same to you, Andrew, but Harry, do you want to answer well, first? Well, I think in terms of anger in Parliament, it is angrier now than it's been for, I'd say, 40 years. But At least. If you, if you go back further, um, 
There were actual fights in the Commons in the 1930s. <laughs> we like to pat ourselves on the back. We don't have those fights that you see in the Italian and yeah. uh, Greek and Turkish yeah. parliaments <laughs> recently, but we did have them in the 30s. Yet, you mean, yet. And, and yet, and, and in the 20s, and, and the very famous incident in 1642 where Charles I marched into the Commons mm. with 400 armed men in search of five MPs, and the famous speaker said, I have no tongue to speak, which you can't imagine the current speaker saying. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, so in historical terms... You missed out the second part. Of the <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, in, in historical terms, actually, the anger in Parliament, although upsetting, uh, is not nearly as bad as it, as it has been in the past. In, in 1642. Well, no, or, or, or 1630, 1642. or the famous incident in 1976 when mm -hmm. Heza picked up the mace and started walking towards the government benches. In recent times, actually, the most violence has come from the public in the gallery. You remember in 2004 when the Fathers for Justice threw a purple flower bomb at Tony Blair and hunting protesters stormed the floor. Yeah. So actually, in historical terms, the anger in the Commons, mm -hmm. if unwelcome, is not it's as bad as it has been. Yeah. Um, with my sense, uh, and need to say I'm going to be mentioning Churchill now. Please um, do. <laughs> the, thank you. Is the moment in, and in, in 1936, he was shouted down in the House of Commons. However loud it got the other day with Barry Shearman screeking uh, in the House of Commons and, and Boris and, and uh, Attorney General Cox bellowing back. Uh, actually, you could hear what they were saying, whereas that isn't the case. That wasn't the case in 1936, where Churchill was just shouted down. And back in 1912, somebody threw um, a book at him, and it hit him in the face and drew blood. This is it, it, during a debate in the House of Commons. And ironically enough, it turned out to be the parliamentary rule book. <laughs> 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 um, but, uh, but, but with regard to the, um, to the wider question about historical mm. precedents and the extent to which, it, it is pretty much, I mean, I feel a bit of a fraud as a historian being here mm. because there aren't that many historical precedents right. for, mm. a, for an opposition, mm. effectively, to take over uh, the, um, the executive function of the government yes. whilst the government's still sitting, sitting there without an election. Yeah, yeah. Wow. that is true. We shall see how all of it unfolds. Um, David, what I want to know from you is, obviously, post-Brexit, we saw a dramatic increase in reported hate crimes, and the type of this type of xenophobia is often blamed on the right. But when you look at the kind of anti-Semitism that's reared its head in the Labour Party, do you think this has unleashed racism across the board? Um, I, th I think some of these things would have happened. And I mean, for, they you haven't do? had Brexit in the United States, and they've got this yeah. uh, to, uh, to, to a large extent. There was, it was a very strange thing that Labour did when it elected Corbyn in 2015. It was an extraordinary accident. It allowed back into the party all kinds of people, a lot of the people that I'd known when I was in student politics, who you really wouldn't normally give house room to in a democratic <laughs> party. And people with who are feel who all, one of whose most animating um, uh, uh, passions is a passion for the cause of the Palestinians, yeah. and these are people who believe that Israel, for instance, shouldn't exist at all, mm. and they consequently believe that somebody who is a Zionist, i.e., somebody who believes that Israel should exist as they define it, is actually a bad person in themselves, and it just so happens that the vast majority of Jews would identify themselves with Zionism and with the idea that there should be a state of Israel. Mm -hmm. And that was therefore was the background at which we had this sort of, we've had this uptick in anti-Semitism in which other Labour Party people coming in who don't have their background, seeing the argument and taking sides in favour of Jeremy Corbyn, then locate the problem of the argument with Jewish organisations yeah. and so on, and actually give themselves a, so there's a kind of progression. Yeah. There's a kind of progression there. In terms of what you might call the uh, racist right, uh, they have been emboldened, but not just in a kind of clunk-click way by Brexit. I don't really, I don't really believe that. Um, but by things like the 2015 refugee crisis and the response to that, um, they have located in, let's say, uh, Muslim um, uh, immigration to Western countries in particular, a very easy target which they know makes other people kind of nervous and which takes other people in mm -hmm. uh, as well. So I am not so convinced that, I mean, I, we, we all know of people, you know, who have been told not to speak Polish, and there was that kind of Farage thing 
which does go on, which is I feel uncomfortable if I hear people speaking another language, language yeah. uh, and so on. Which for most of us, let's say Londoners, <laughs> seems a bizarre kind of, uh, you know, I mean, you know, like my grandparents coming over, my grandmother spoke nothing but Yiddish. Right, the way, almost until she died. It's funny to think that old Farage would have found her an uncomfortable uh, person to share a, a share a bus with. I think she'd have found him an extremely uncomfortable person to share a bus with. <laughs> to share anything. Yeah. So, so for you, you think this would have happened regardless? Do you I think don't, it was I, always bubbling under the I surface? I think some people would have been emboldened. I mean, part of the problem with this linguistic problem, and mm. I really felt it when the Attorney General pointed to Parliament and said, you have no moral right to sit. And I thought, if the Attorney General tells Parliament, Imagine. which he's a part, that he has no moral right to sit, i.e. he has no moral right to sit, which means he has no moral right to be Attorney General, uh, which gets him to a very equal part. The moment he said, you have no moral right to sit, oops, and then he should have sat down. Yeah. Um, uh, that is really difficult. We are, no, I can't remember a mainstream conservative who would ever have said anything remotely like that during my, uh, during, I might have said it when I was a student communist. Yeah. You had no moral <laughs> right, right to sit, etc. It's kind of conservative <laughs> attorney general, and you think the world's turned upside down. What the hell uh, is going and so, on? And so I, I, and it is true that there is a certain section, particularly for the moment, of the uh, Brexit side, which considers itself so justified in its anger mm. that it will do things that the other, the other Brexit people will really not like. And you've seen some of that outside Parliament. Uh, and it can get quite violent, kind of pro-Tommy Robinson yeah. uh, We no people. longer seem to know what the boundaries are anymore. Uh, but I have a feeling that most of those people would have found some reason for right. rioting anyway. Okay. And I think one of the things that's quite worrying is we don't see politicians actually addressing the causes of Brexit enough or looking at ways to come up with solutions to help those that have been uh, left behind as a result of globalisation. So what kind of policies do you think we need for those communities? Regardless well, yeah, of what happens. That's a, that, that's a very good question. I, mean, I think, to be honest, I think a lot of politicians who are thoughtful and not just going into sort of tub thump for yeah. a particular instance, are actually very unsure about what to do yeah. about this. I mean, we sometimes have to acknowledge that the political Seem to be class is sort of avoiding it. it is, uh, well, I think that the reason they're avoiding it, Jude, is if, if you want to resist it, I mean, if, you, if your whole narrative is, I'm going to find so much wrong with this until you give me a second referendum where I think, you know, speaks the the very strong uh, remainer, the, the, the public will see their error of its ways, which is a view that I keep hearing and I think there's vanishingly little evidence for, then of course your, you know, that's your, your aim is to do that. It's not to say, and it's a very good point that was made by a Labour MP to me, about a year into this sort of three years uh, sort of slodge that we've been going through that Andrew referred to, was like, for all these people, and he's a very strong remainer, this guy, and he said, look, have they actually been in their constituency and asked and, and done any research, yeah. proper research, yes. not just like getting people who come to meetings that they know what they think anyway, and mm. people say, I oh, hear it on the doorstep. Well, the kind of people who tell you stuff on the doorstep are in themselves a particular group of yeah. people. Most people, they just go, oh, God, is it a politician? Yeah, or cut the opening curtains. the door. <laughs> Close the curtains, John, you know, let's, let's put the telly off. Um, <laughs> so there's, there is a, a tendency not to want to do that, that work. There is a, a dislocation between the cities and the towns and countryside. Yeah. And as much as I take, I'm very happy to live in a diverse uh, metropolis, but I do come from the sticks and from a sort of fairly leavey part of uh, mm -hmm. northwest Durham. And when you say, well, everyone's sort of comfortable sitting on buses hearing other languages, well, actually, in a lot of places, they're not. They're not. Yeah. And whether you feel they should be or not, and if you, want, you know, how you, uh, if you have those changes yeah. of immigration and the labour market changes, I've been hearing you know, people very progressive, small p, progressive, laboury people around me, including in our friendship group um, you know, in the northeast, suddenly saying, oh, well, yeah, Newcastle's suddenly full of Polish people. And they knew it wasn't right to say yeah. they didn't like it. They were but not they felt that way. But I could tell them yeah. that, you know, you can sense a discomfort. Now, I think there's a lot of us in, in you know, maybe if you're speaking for parts of the southeast where it's much more common, you just learn to sort of either you accepted it yeah. or you just shut up about it. Yeah. And the fact is there are a lot of people, the town, countries, your schools are often not as good, your public services are under more pressure, yeah. your local hospital is likely to be considerably worse. Yeah. And all of this is the stuff that is not getting dealt with. 
partly because Brexit is lock locking out the light, but partly because big policy changes tend to be innovated and happen in the cities. Yeah. The one that I'm, I would say I'm very on side with, but I've learned a bit of a, a lesson about parts of it, city academies. Why cities? You know, yeah. We went along with that. A lot of us are in favor of that yes, kind of exactly. supply-side education mm -hmm. reform. I'm thinking, cities, what is that word what saying? Yeah, what that so say? I think that's the kind of area where I think politicians are both centre-left, centre-right, and everyone who wants to be helpful yeah. um, and really have to go over some of their own policy yeah. responses. And, and the thing is, much. this will only get worse with the fourth industrial revolution. It's, it's going it, to get it worse. Certainly, whether it gets worse, I don't know, because the fourth industrial revolution has great promise as well for ease for productivity which we desperately sorry to be putting economists out on we do need to, to get up um, but you're right it will be more intense and the gaps will be more widely felt so you could say something more radical will have to be done and you don't actually have to be very far left or very far on the right to see that how are you I, i'm not sure policies make that much difference because so much of the reason you don't think so what no that so much of the reason why people voted either leave or remain were emotional and sentimental rather than pragmatic and economic, as well as those mm. arguments. I think the very good analysis is by David Goodhart a couple of years ago mm. about somewheres voting remain, those who stay in the same place, anywheres who are moving around the country and the world voted. Um, uh, uh, sorry, the other way around. Other way around, yeah. Other yeah. Way around. Um, yeah. And actually, of course, there are exceptions to that rule. Um, but Rod Liddell's got a new book out about Brexit where he describes, he's from Middlesbrough, mm. and he went back to a school reunion and he said everyone who had stayed in Middlesbrough, voted whether they'd done very well or badly in life, yeah. voted that's Brexit. Right. Everyone who'd left, whether they'd done well that's or badly, voted, um, remained. Remain. So I think that's, that's, as well as economics obviously mm. always mattering, I think emotional and sentimental things matter powerfully too. Okay. So let's move on uh, to Boris. <laughs> Johnson. <laughs> that guy, <laughs> just in case you were wondering. So I want to start with you uh, first, Harry. Um, your thoughts? Well, I, as I said, I worked with Boris for five years at The Telegraph, and I share the views of our editor then, Charles Moore, um, who quoted David Niven on Errol Flynn, who said, you could always rely on Errol for one thing, he'll always let you down. <laughs> and and that's, that's the same with Boris. He long ago learned the ancient art of being an Englishman, which is to say sorry the whole time and not mean it. Uh, so <laughs> for five years, I was ostensibly his boss. I was the deputy comment editor of The Telegraph, and he was the columnist on The Telegraph. Um, and for five years, all the other columnists delivered at four in the afternoon because Boris is a special case. He was allowed to deliver at seven. And most Wednesday evenings, five years, nothing arrived at seven. So I'd ring him up and say, Boris, where's the article? And he'd say, sorry, he'd apologize a lot. So sorry. Bloody internet. It's making its way down those threadbare <laughs> copper wires as we speak. And you could quite often hear him in the background <laughs> typing away as he said this. So all the things his uh, understandable enemies say about him are true. He is unreliable. He is disingenuous. I, I must admit, and I realize it's not a popularly shared opinion, I do still like him enormously. He's, he's, he's actually, in terms of conversation, he is very civil. Unlike a lot of politicians, he does listen to you and he flatters you. So when I occasionally see him, he still says, 10 years ago I worked with him, he still goes in front of other people, oh Christ, watch out, here's my boss. And I never was really his boss. He knows that, I know that. I'm but it flattered. makes you feel good. Yeah, so he, he, so he is very, very charming personally. In terms of politics, this is the job he's dreamed of all his life. Famously, he said to his sister, Rachel, when five, she said, um, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he thought world, for a moment, went, ah, world king. Yeah. And he, he really did think there was a job called world king. Yeah. So this is the job he's wanted to do all his life for various strange reasons. He funked it in 2016. So he's uh, really doubling down, as I said, on, on the uh, uh, Brexit project. I, th I think actually in his heart, he was originally a Remainer, yes. half brought up in Brussels. The rest of his family are all mm. Remainers. But as he reported on Brussels in the 90s, mm. his head moved over towards Brexit. And then he famously wrote two pieces of the Telegraph, one for Remain, 
Wonderful one for leave. leave. And as I've said, it was hard enough to get him to write one article. The <laughs> yeah, idea. <laughs> um, but so now, um, all those things I say, uh, I think, are still true. It's unreliable. Um, I wouldn't trust him. I wouldn't want to be married to him. But I still think he's highly, highly intelligent. Is is his greatest, greatest virtue? Was I that think. ever an option? What the marriage bit? No, yeah. he never. He hasn't offered yet. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew. Um, it was Malcolm Muggeridge, the great uh, Malcolm Muggeridge journalist, who said that the British uh, prime ministers tend to um, uh, tend to veer between either being a bookie or a bishop. Yeah, and um, under under Theresa May, we had the most ecclesiastical of, uh, yeah. of bishops. And now, and John Major was a bishop, and there are all sorts <laughs> of uh, bishops in the past. And now, very clearly, we have got a bookie. A bookie. <laughs> and that is not necessarily a bad thing because he has got a capacity and an extraordinary effectiveness to, um, to, to talk to people, to relate to people, to uh, um, at least to explain what he wants in, uh, in language that they understand and they don't feel um, talked down to. And that is, that is working, in my view. I, the way in which the, the polls have been working well, since poll, he took over... No, he's, have, he's down um, to 36%, isn't he? Not, um, no, he was at the, was well, it? the last one I saw, it was, at the, it was uh, over 40. Well, no, I'm talking th from, Mrs., from Mrs May. It's time. Okay. He's, he's considerably more popular. And, in, and the one in the mail on uh, Sunday today, more people wanted him than Corbyn. By a, by, a, I agree. This isn't the, this isn't the dichotomy, <laughs> of course, that, that David mentioned <laughs> earlier. But, but, but ultimately, actually, it is going to be one of those two people who becomes prime minister. Yeah. It's not. And it, no, it, no, it no. most certainly no. is. No, it's, it's not. All oh, right. You don't think no, I don't think so. Okay, because who's going to be Prime Minister? No, I don't think so. I think there's going to... I think there's going to... Okay, name, hope, name who no. it's going to yeah, be. No, I'm not, be. I'm not going to, but... Okay, fair enough. No, 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 that, no, no, I'm not having this trick done on me. It's about, no. been done about three times already this week by various Tories. They say, you can't name who else you're going to... In a situation, Andrew, of a really hung Parliament, you cannot be at all sure who the next Prime Minister will be. But it's, got to, be the, it's got to be the leader of one of the two No, it, does, no it, it, doesn't. Tell me when it, it doesn't. It has to be the person who can command a majority in the House of Commons. But David, if you're looking at the polls, it does look like it will be one of the two. No, it does. Actually, looking at, looking at the polls... Me, like, the leader of the, of the Liberal Party is going to allow... Um, sorry, the, le the leader of the Labour Party is going to allow a non... Um, mm. socialist, a non-Labour person to become Prime they Minister may, of the country. The, the Labour Party in the House of Commons may have to. I'm sa I am saying that. I'm but saying we're moving into one charter territory. And, on. and, 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 the, and both the Corbynites and the, um, the Johnsonites are testing this absolutely to destruction. I mean, they're testing it to destruction. So... I'm not, so it is not inevitable that it's going to be one of the others. And it may very well be that the, uh, the Labour Party is not even the main opposition. That's, that, that, is, that is quite conceivable. Um, so let's not, I mean, so all I'm saying is, I want to, I, mean, I want to let you finish about Boris Johnson before I have my go about yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. So, so my sense is that he has a message which is um, uncontestable in that he very clearly wants to take us out of the European Union. And the other parties, except for the Liberal Party, are not anything like so clear. And there's a, there's a, a sense of a need for finality in, um, in our politics today. He is offering it, and so I think but, that he's going to do an awful lot better than, than David obviously does. But Andrew, does. just to push back a little bit, I think the other parties are quite clear in that they do not want us to crash out of Europe. I think they're quite clear on that, and everything they've done up until this point suggests that. Yes, yes. Of course, you can't have the word no deal unless you add the adjective disastrous in front of it. Yes. Um, and uh, even yes. though, as I say, in the Mail on Sunday uh, poll today, there are more people who would prefer the so-called disastrous no deal than to have um, Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister. Well, <laughs> many more, only like eight, nine percent more. Which is no surprise whatsoever. The <laughs> Labour Party committed a major act of harakiri when they put the man there. Um, yeah. But I go back to it. The idea that somehow or other, because the Labour Party have sodded up in that kind of a way, the only alternative the rest of us are left with is this charlatan Boris Johnson. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Because we have indulged this man 
all of us for 20 years because of his Etonian charm uh, and his bluster and his kind of comedy skill. Well, here's something that I think, believe it was General Patton, but you may uh, uh, um, uh, tell me d differently, Andrew, who said on command, taking command of a division that you can prove yourself to be a bastard at the beginning and a bastard at the end, or you can prove yourself to be a good guy at the beginning or a good guy at the end, but the thing that you cannot do is prove this, make yourself seem like a good guy at the beginning and turn out to be a bastard. That's the one that doesn't work, and that is the business which Boris Johnson has of necessity embarked upon. Does anybody here believe like that. that if Boris Johnson had <laughs> thought that the majority of the Tory party were in favour of Remain, he wouldn't have been a Remainer. Does anybody credibly in this room believe that? Do that, you're wrong, sir. You are wrong. You are wrong, sir. You don't know him. And I don't even think that Andrew or Harry would believe that for five seconds. If the Tory party... If the Tory party if, you can shout at me later. I'll come, I'll come to you at the end for questions, and don't worry. If the Tory party had not taken this turn, then, then Boris Johnson would not have taken this turn. All this anger about it is essentially confected anger because he knows very well, and as has quite rightly been said by Harry, his family sees it another way. Not only that, the man is a, uh, a proven liar on almost every occasion when he's actually put to the test. It just is. That's not, no, that's, not a con that's not a conjecture. That's a simple fact. He lied when he was a journalist. He was fired for lying when he was a journalist. And people like, he went into the last election at the Labour, uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the last London mayor election saying, under no circumstances would he become an MP during his term of office. He broke that promise. Everybody said, oh, it's just Boris David. Johnson. Nobody cares. We get how you feel about <laughs> Boris. It's <laughs> not how I feel about him. Okay. Let's face it, let's face it, people. That's how our Prime Minister actually is. That's who we've got. And finally, finally, you didn't vote for him. You didn't vote for him to be Prime Minister. 90,000 superannuated Tories voted for him to be well, Prime they Minister. Will get and the rest of us got no choice <laughs> whatsoever. And bringing it back to the civility side of things, over to you. Thank you. You know, I came in here from, to, to hear from, from Ukraine, and I now feel like a, an under-pressure country between two warring great powers. Um, I won't say who I think is kind of Russia and who's America in this, in this argument. I think both, actually, you know, there are really good, good points that go to Andrew's sort of belief in, in Boris and, and David's anger. But I do think that uh, but those on the Remain side, and if you like, broadly speaking, and I'm sorry, it is sort of lazy language to talk about liberal centre left. I mean, we can all, you know, we all fit somebody else's stereotypes. But I wonder whether being angry about Boris Johnson kind of understands enough about his appeal. So I'm, I'm not as much in the fan club as, as Andrew. I've also known him for about 100 years. And he's often, you know, being sort of obfuscatory not to put, you know, not always truthful. Do you mean he lies? Well, let, let no, I think I can speak for myself. Mm -hmm. On the David. whole, um, <laughs> do it then. So I don't think no, I don't think I've kind of directly lie, but I have heard him certainly go, you know, make make stories that were, were kind of didn't give a full account of the truth. <laughs> so have a lot of other politicians I have dealt with across the years. They've allowed things to be understood that weren't true. Boris is just is painted brighter colours. He has a stage name, which I can tell irritates uh, uh, David Aronovich. Um, I don't quite feel no great. Yeah, it actually, I think we all know if you write properly and you're doing your sort of due diligence, you call him Boris Johnson, but he has had a, a stage name. A lot of people sucked up to Tony Blair and called him Tony all the time, never seemed to bother anyone, uh, or probably only bothered their enemies. So one of the things I think Boris Johnson has is that direct connection. The fact that he breaks the rules when and a lot of people in society don't like the rules. They don't think the rules serve them very well. So you get a lot of the sort of what I worry about, in about the Trumpian opposition. Way. No, not in a Trumpian way, because that is already, to me, doing a sort of equivalence that I think no, is I'm wrong. No, I'm talking about uh, breaking the rules. Yeah, breaking a yeah, rule breaker, yes. I mean. But not yeah. that uh, it's too sort of broad, uh, I think, and often a, a flawed analogy. Yeah, Boris's yeah. politics are very different for I don't from mean Donald politically Trump's. in terms of Sorry, politics. Sorry, just, just, just seeing as we put yeah. the Trump word, a word in there, it's very yeah. easy to go, go scootering off that, yeah. that way. So what I would just say is a sort of maybe a big counter question about the next election and what lies beyond it is not how cross do you feel about Boris Johnson? How loud can you shout in the comments about it? How great or otherwise is your second referendum campaign? It's 
we come back to the question we started with, which is what have you learned from this which will inform your politics? And then to Boris Johnson, the question would be if he becomes prime minister, and I still think you know, he could, could go either way, but quite, he could, certainly could, is what is his bridge back to civility? Yeah. Because that is, and, you know, to put the pressure on the other side, yeah. it is easy once you start to use this language, yeah. To, Very hard to come to back. To get back over that bridge. And he used to be funny, which was really what your book is about, Harry. Mm. And which it, now I think you know, there is a lot of anger coming at him. But also his own language is not, is not witty anymore. It's sometimes very harsh, and it sometimes lacks emotional intelligence. So he has to get back over a bridge as well. And uh, who does that better? I think we'll have the better future in British politics. And final question uh, to you all, talking about getting back over uh, the bridge and getting back to civility. Um, as a nation, and if you could answer quickly, so we have time yes. for questions, how do we do that? How do we get to a place where both sides are satisfied? I think I'll start with you first, Andrew. Oh, we do what the 17.4 million people voted for, obviously. Oh, That's what we do. And we, 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 we do that. We um, agree <laughs> to go ahead and actually do what the people voted for. And then after that, it will have launched a terrible boil that has been growing and growing for the last three years. OK. Harry. Uh, I think Andrew's, Andrew's right. And uh, actually, the strange thing is we've been talking about this anger and uncivil behavior largely between MPs. I think there has been a slight increase in racist incidents. But actually, in the country okay. at large, I wonder what the audience think. But I haven't noticed any increase in general incivility. We're talking about a small group of people still to be regretted. In a so I think bubble. if and when this is resolved, and it may take five years, it may take ten years, mm. but in the end we'll return back to our normal levels of, in, of civility. And Just very briefly, I would say we accept whichever side we're on that we're not going to get everything we want. Yes. And that to me is, is yeah. absolutely the key to yeah. it. And there was the attempt by the, the ill-fated Theresa May deal, the all sorts of uh, issues and problems are around the way it was put together. But, it, you know, the instinct was right that not everyone, you can't always get what you want. And this is well, the next period in politics will only, I think, improve when we have we strong that. advocates yeah. for me getting up there saying, this is my position, but this is what I'm prepared to accept. So yeah. for me, the, the people like Stephen Kinnock and the Labour Party, to an extent, uh, Rory Stewart, but also others in the Conservative Party, who are factoring that into their argument, mm. they, to me, are, are, are some of those I, I would like to see you know, be, being praised and given more credit. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. David. Well, it's not going to come as a huge surprise to people here to, to, for me to say that I think that we should put whatever deal or no deal um, actually uh, comes about to the people with the option to stay. That's a democratic vote, and not only that, it allows more of the people I see at the front here the opportunity to vote who weren't able to vote in the 2016 referendum. Uh, we've now moved on three years from that. I think people have learned a lot since then, but I don't necessarily believe that the result would be different. But I do think that if people voted to leave then, then for. they would actually know what they were voting for, and that would be a resolution to it. Okay. So we're going to open it up for questions. Do we have a roving mic? I'm going to go to this gentleman here first, uh, David's friend over here. <laughs> what was it that you wanted to say? What's your name as well? Uh, my name is uh, Ian Craig. I'm Hi. from Belfast. Mm -hmm. I'm also a superannuated Tory. It's <laughs> obviously virtually time for my evening tea. <laughs> and if we're talking about return to civility, the road will be a long one, I imagine, for Mr. Aranovich. The, uh, the only chap uh, He's not... He's actually very sweet. <laughs> well, the only, person that, that, the only person that got unnecessarily excited on this particular panel was yourself, sir. And I, I, I agree with, with Andrew Why? Roberts Why? that it's a question, it's a question, a, a simple question. There was a majority vote in 2016. The decision was ceded by the House of Commons, by Parliament, to the people for a specific question. And it is a tenable argument to make that the individual MPs in this instant are not representatives, they are delegates and they are obliged to fulfil the will of the majority of the United Kingdom people. Thank you. David? Um, it's an interesting position coming from Belfast, where the majority of people in Northern Ireland voted to remain. 
Uh, and you'd have to reflect upon the position of people uh, uh, in Scotland as well, where the overwhelming... Uh, it's, it's an oddity, isn't it, really? I mean, no, no, it's, it's, no, it's no use you're gesticulating at me like that. That's kind of... I said, no, no, uh, you are represented... We are representing the House of Commons by almost by one single party from Northern Ireland, which has represented one of the most extreme versions of the... They have voted down the Brexit deal. You could have had... You could have been out by now if it hadn't been for the Democratic Unionist Party, the party well, which gets the majority of seats in Belfast, in, in Belfast. And the Remainers have been mostly represented by a party, Sinn Féin, who won't take up their seats in Westminster at all. So Northern Ireland has managed this actually brilliant business, because of its own history, of being represented, its own view, which is Remain, being represented in Parliament by the most uh, dogged um, uh, leavers. Um, and that has been part of the problem. As I said, you could have had the thing that you say you wanted if you'd had a different politics in Northern Ireland. That's part of the irony, uh, irony of it. Had those ERG people, the hard Brexiteers and the DUP, voted for Theresa May's deal, we would mm. be out by now. It's not my fault. And don't, and don't take me to task for raising my voice a little bit because I'm a bit kind of annoyed about where it's gone. I mean, everybody's doing this at the moment. I'm not calling anybody anything. I'm just telling you the truth. Uh, you could have been out now if the Tories and the DUP had united and voted for Theresa May's deal. You didn't do it. Gentleman here. I mean, I can't see um, any end to the chaos, but uh, whether it's Jeremy Corbyn... Is this to anyone in particular on the no, panel? No, it is generally to the panel. OK. Um, or Boris Johnson, we, we've got enough information to hopefully make up our own minds. But we hear about the shadowy figure behind, who's possibly anti-establishment, uh, Dominic Cummings. Is there anything from a personal um, liaison, communication, knowledge that you can give us about, about him? I, I know Dominic. I know Dominic. Yeah. Dominic. But uh, um, what he's historically <laughs> done, and first of all, in the flesh, just so you know, he's, he's extremely polite, but that's neither here nor there, really. But his, his history has been quite mm. extraordinary, that he comes in on these campaigns and historically has won them. So he first started on business for sterling to stop us going to the euro. He then um, fought a, a long forgotten campaign. You remember that John Prescott wanted to start a Northeastern Assembly, and he came up with a brilliant idea, Dominic, of hiring an inflatable white elephant, <laughs> flying it over the prospective site of the new assembly. I think it cost 250 quid. <laughs> And he won. There was a <laughs> mini referendum there. He won in the referendum against proportional representation. And he, each time he comes in for a short period of time and then he goes back to what he refers to as his bunker in the garden in his parents' house in County Durham. Uh, we, we, we shall see if, um, if, if he'll be successful with this one. But that, that's what he does. He, he, he darts in for a few months and wins on the whole. Can I just dart in on the words County Durham, <laughs> land of my father's, uh, decided to go to the Clute nightclub, which is, was known as the worst nightclub in Europe, in Durham, <laughs> where Dominic Cummings was the doorman lady, so don't imagine no. that. <laughs> and so if you imagine Dominic Cummings's kind of communication style on, you know. Um, so I think it's actually an interesting point that, that uh, Dominic Cummings, who was following, comes, have you known him? oh dear God. Anyway, I mean, it, it, actually, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for that, Drew. Um, but through sort of, and it, not well through thick and thin, but through thick and thin, he's an amazingly good campaigner. And it's, it, you know, this whole sort of the dark force behind Boris Johnson, what we mean is someone who's a ruthless and focused campaigner who doesn't play by the rules. Everybody else thinks they're playing by, and made a documentary about the, the referendum campaigns. That was really very apparent. Now, to a lot of people, it's very reprehensible. But I think the fact that he comes from the Northeast, so that he understands that there is sort of a lot of people just think they don't really see the rules the way that, you know, you, we're always being told, even by a sort of aggregate of the London uh, media that the rules are, that there's a, a lot of truth in that. The other thing that makes me laugh is that Dominic Cummings has a fantastically sort of Geordie accent, which puzzles me because he went to the posh school and I went to the not posh school and I talk like this. So <laughs> I think <laughs> there has always been an element of Dominic which was kind of reinventing himself as a really hard lad from the North East. Yes. And that, but he does it to great effect and those who want to oppose him need, need to be aware of that as totally. well. Totally. I think it's also worth pointing out that it, throughout history, advisors have been blamed for things that ultimately <laughs> is the decision of the, of the Leader, principal rather yeah. than the, uh, the advisor. 
And, uh, and I know, and like uh, Dominic Cummings, and I feel that he is deliberately um, attempting part of the job to be a lightning conductor. Um, and so we shouldn't really uh, concentrate uh, quite so much on, uh, on this person who advises, because in the end, it's, it's Boris who uh, decides. Okay. Um, my, my question is um, around the emotive language that's being used in... Um, this debate, um, and that what I see over the years is, is this growing pressure, this growing uh, drive towards sort of violence against each other because of the emotive language that has been accepted. And, and now it seems to be personalized to one person or it's, you know, one side will point to the other side. So my question is, can you comment on the word crashing out? <laughs> Because for me, I understand it was about leaving a, a group of countries or s remaining or staying in a group of countries. When I hear the word crashing out, when I've ever had a crash, the emotion that I feel is I, have, I, am, I am hurt, I have pain. And yet it is used as if it's okay to use this language where somebody might leave the EU and feel liberated. <laughs> might feel great or they might not but surely if we're going to start to go down the, the line of, of, of pointing the fingers at emotive language causing violence let's look at our own language what, what would you rather than crashing out uh, leave I, I would use non-emotive non language leave or remain that's not a problem how you experience it is your experience okay well if you use an emotive look oh, is is crashing out emotive yeah. david the thing is if you remember um back in the day the idea was that leaving the eu and getting what people said vaguely was a very good deal was going to be really easy do you remember that david davis said how easy it was going to be he was only uh, Brexit secretary, by the way, um, and a whole lot of other people said it would be easy. They would want a good deal with us. We would get it quite easily. Uh, because nobody discussed the terms, there was warnings that there was a problem with uh, certain kinds of deals um, uh, in the island of Ireland because of the very unique nature of that. People weren't interested in that. So by and large, most people who said, who argued for leaving the EU argued that there would be a deal and a good one before we left. That's one of the reasons why leaving without a deal, it's not just leaving, it's leaving without a deal, without an agreed deal, was seen as crashing out. It was what nobody wanted to do. Now, it is true... Sorry. sorry no, well, not in my opinion. You won't find but there are very a lot many of people, people... You won't... Uh, I'm really sorry. I'm really, I'm but, really, I'm really sorry. Maybe but, you'll take it. Maybe you'll take it from. Maybe you'll, hold on. Maybe you'll take it from Anne rather than from me because of the positions that I've adopted up until now. But yeah, I think she will agree yeah. with me that by and large, this yeah. was presented yeah. as something on which there would be a deal. I don't know why you think shouting well, at me is working. They can't hear you at the back. Could, I, could one, one moment? But wouldn't you accept though? There are people who wanted us to leave the EU but think we shouldn't leave without a deal. Somebody like a Michael Gove. So this is the point he's making. So we understand what you're saying, but he is making a point here. Uh, Mr. You've shouted Ronovich, yourself to a microphone. Yes, yes I will. Mr. Uh, uh, David Aronovich was talking about lying before. So when David Davis said that he thought it was easy to get a deal, which he may or may not have done, but I presume he did, he was not Brexit secretary. So that is a, you know, that is an untruth. Actually, he it's, was. No, he wasn't Brexit secretary yes, when he, he said that. Before the referendum. Oh, I see. You mean yeah, to yeah. the week before yeah. he was Brexit secretary when no, he said it, he, other yeah. than the times yeah, that no. he said it implied but, so, it afterwards. Yeah. But and, uh, and, and before the referendum, everyone from David Cameron to Peter Mandelson to Jeremy Corbyn, they all said that it meant leaving without a deal. Leaving on WTO terms, leaving the single market. I'm really I think sorry. All that is said just that. I think we're they all said that. I have seen I've, them. Well, I was I there. I think we're going to have to agree to disagree it. on that yeah, point. And, and that's and fair let's, enough. But let's that's, move that's on where to the we next come question. Into about lies. We understand what you're saying. Yeah. Thank you. So, Thank you. Uh, 
if we're going to ask to do three questions quickly and then I'll get you to all answer all at once. So if you can be quick, gentleman behind you, and then there's the lady at the back. So yeah, and then hand it to him. Hi, I, I'd be curious to hear from each of you. Um, the, this, the, the whole conversation took place on the, with a backdrop regarding, disregarding the, so the state of the economy. If you posit that there will be a significant economic downturn, how do you think the politics and the outcome of this will change? Okay. I, couldn't, I, I, I didn't hear if that. If there was a significant economic impact downturn, how would politics change? Good question. Do you think a possible outcome of the election could be that the Brexit and the Conservative Party do some sort of a deal? And form a government. And, and, no, and f to go to the country. Okay. And the, the uh, Remainers vote for the Liberals. The Brexiteers vote for the Conservatives and the Brexit people and the Labour Party gets more or less wiped out for sitting on the fence. Okay. Sorry, so, so, so sorry the, sorry. Yeah, the question was, um, we've talked a lot, there's been lots of good points raised about inclusion of rural and urban and also um, sort of the social media side of things. I'm curious what mechanisms you see that will reintroduce civility and, and dialogue at a political level through the media which is still so soundbite-led that it's incredibly difficult for us to imagine true debate in our political system right now. Okay. Uh, so, first question is, will the politics change if there's an economic downturn? Will Labour be wiped out? And how the media represents the divide between the rural and urban? Um, can you ask them, answer them in succession quickly? Who would you start want to with that. Who would you like I to start with you. Okay. Um, so I think the first question is a really fascinating one. I think I would not ever want to predict. I think that the correlation between one particular event, even something of the magnitude of leaving on whatever terms we leave, or, or indeed uh, don't, or it gets kicked into the, the long grass, and immediate economic damage, it always turns out to be a little bit dubious. And I think uh, a lot of the predictions that were made, as well as all sorts of predictions made in the referendum campaign, turned out not to be true. One of the things I would warn against is anyone who, if you want to kind of frighten people into remaining by saying, oh, there's terrible downturn. Someone said to me, Didn't well, work last three, time. no, exactly, exactly. Well, I mean, you know, you can certainly argue that there's a confidence issue with the UK economy. The underlyings of the UK economy, I've just been with a bunch of investors who just put their money where their mouth is. Yeah, FDI is pretty strong. Inward investment is pretty strong. The fact we want to sort of beat ourselves up and have decided that we'd like to, you know, to extend this, uh, this, this trauma can do us a lot of damage in terms of consumer confidence. But I don't think the, the problem is so much that you see a vast falling off in growth. When you look at the fact that the Eurozone is really flat and actually failing in many ways, we're not out of line with the Eurozone. So if we're doing something so bad, but they're a sort of all together, but they're doing badly, then people will, I think, sort of think, mm, well, hang on, that's that. That can't only be down to Brexit. The problem that I do see, which is on the crashing out point the lady made earlier, there is clearly a bigger shock to the system if you leave without a deal than if you leave with a deal. And to me, the, the impact is not that you have a sudden, you know, two points off your growth. It's that you have 10 years of fighting through a kind of sludge to get, yeah. you know, to get some stability back into yeah. the system. And you will be, whatever side you're on, whether you're cheering David and hating Andrew the other way around, you're going to be so bored of it. So I think we're really what needs to happen is the focus yeah. needs to be on calming things down so that the UK economy can continue to do what it is actually doing pretty well. And we shouldn't you know, wish ourselves, <coughs> whatever our politics, into a sort of things must go badly in order to, to prove me right. I'll leave it there. All right. On the idea of a, a Brexit party, Conservative Party deal, I think it's highly unlikely. Nigel Farage is longing for one. The Sunday Telegraph readers here will have seen a two-page ad today on page two and three by the Brexit party with him saying he's keen to do a deal. Boris has completely written one off. And uh, as is always the case, the real hatreds aren't between uh, the two differing opinions. They're within the same side. And the people who really loathe each other uh, Dominic Cummings and Nigel Farage uh, during yes. the campaign. Yes. They absolutely That's hated each other. So I would have thought a deal was incredibly unlikely. Um, I, I agree with that, um, but I, I feel sad about it because I don't think two people should uh, be able to prevent uh, something that is as obvious as this because there are various um, 
constituencies, especially in the north of England, where Anne comes from, that have never voted Tory since the Second World War, never returned a Tory yeah. since the Second World War. It's insane for us to stand someone there when a Brexit Party could, um, member could deny, could deny Jeremy Corbyn that seat. It seems absolutely insane as far as I'm concerned. David, do you want to wrap up for us? Um, I very much hope that the Tory party form an alliance with the Brexit party, the sort Andrew. Good. I'm pretty confident that that will lead to their utter destruction. <laughs> um, I, I, unfortunately, the vagaries of the third past the first, first past the post system almost certainly won't work in that direction. There are lots of directions they may work in, but I'm relatively confident it won't work. One of the things that people have to remember is, in this kind of incredible... Uh, way a shorthand we have of suggesting that every northerner was uh, leave and every metropolitan Londoner was remain. And I can assure you, I know a lot of leaving Londoners and there are an awful lot of remaining northerners, particularly younger ones. Um, and incidentally, you never get them on the Vox Pops. You don't get them on the Vox Pops for the simple reason that they're at work. Um, it really is. I can assure you, as somebody who's done Vox Pops, etc., what you do is you go to the market store places because the storeholders can't move and you wait for their elderly customers who are the people who still go to come up and those are the people in your Vox Pops almost always. It's so like it's a kind a of... Skin, it really is. It's like, absolutely, who's there? Uh, well, they haven't got anything better to do. You can get Aronovich and Roberts and McElvey. Obviously, Anne has something much better to do. Um, on that note, can we have a round of applause for our panel, David Ronovich, Anne McAvoy, Harry Mack, and Andrew Roberts. <laughs>